Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Pioneer Baptist Church. My name is Pastor James. Grab your Bibles and open them up with me to the book of Judges, chapter 21. We'll be finishing the book today. We're going to jump right in after we say an opening prayer. So if you would like to press pause on the video and pray independently, when you press play again, we'll be back ready to jump right into scripture. I encourage you to do so, and uh, I look forward to learning with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this great opportunity to finish this very uh, challenging book. We ask God that you'd allow us to be sensitive um, to what it says, that we might not harden our hearts and repeat history. Father, help us to take uh, you at your word. Help us to trust in you alone. God, I pray that your blessings would return and you would fall, it would fall on our people. God, I ask that you just bless our time together here this morning that we would be able to look to you and understand what it is that you've called us to do in our lives. We ask God that you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, everybody, we are in the last chapter, the end of the book of Judges. Many of you who have joined us along this journey will be a little sad. It's like the closing of an error. Many of you who have uh, been weary of seeing such tragic stories may be happy that it is over. But brothers and sisters, we still have one more story left. And before we get to the end of it, I wanna challenge you to not dismiss the book of Judges or any Old Testament book because it says challenging things or because it's difficult to understand. This is the word of the Lord and it is living and active. The New Testament tells us explicitly that the Old Testament stories of Israel and their relationship with God are for our instructions so that we do not repeat their past mistakes. So let us look at what happens when we don't look to, when we don't listen to our God. Let us learn lessons from what happens when we turn to idols and worship other things than God. Let us not make the same mistakes and so that we can avoid the discipline that fell on them and the destruction that fell on them. Do not be deceived. God is almighty and all powerful. He is full of love and also wrath. He is not to be trifled with. And because he is this way, many of us will be tempted to look to other gods to other resources, rather than to look to God for healing, for restoration, for confession. We'll be tempted to look to things of this world because we're impatient or because we want our way, because we're tempted to not want to submit to him. But trust me when I tell you, brothers and sisters, regardless of what you think is in charge or who you think is in charge, God is in charge. And what we need to do is to remember to worship him, honor him, live for him. And if we do, his covenant promise to bless us will be upon us, both for eternity in heaven, but also here on earth. So if you're far away from God now, if you hear this story today and you feel like, man, this is me, I have allowed myself to wander too far down the path um, away from the Lord, I have worship other gods. I have been rebellious. I've hardened my heart. I've heard his word, but I haven't listened to it. And then brothers and sisters, look today with me at the results of that rebellion. And let us consider whether we want this future for ourselves or whether we would want to have a different path, one of blessing and one of walking with the Lord. So the questions before us today, we're going to read this last chapter. There are two parts to it. And so we will take them in order and then we'll be finished. It's a very simple story with a very simple ending. Let's enjoy it together. In chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Now the men of Israel had sworn at Mitzvah, saying, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin in marriage. Now, for those of you who haven't been listening, Benjamin is a tribe in Israel. The whole of Israel went to war against Benjamin in the last few chapters because of an atrocity that happened in a small town there called Gibeah. Now they, Gibeah um, 
was a town that a Levite priest and his concubine took refuge in. Um, the men of Gibeah surrounded the house while the, they were staying in at night and brutally raped and killed the concubine of the Levite. The Levite, being so distraught because they were actually after him, um, dismembered the lady's body and sent it to the 12 tribes of Israel and said, come and let's do something about this evil that is in Gibeah, which abides in Benjamin. So when they did that, they wanted to just kill the men who, as a nation, they wanted to kill the men who did this atrocity. But in Benjamin, the, 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 the nation state of Benjamin, the part of the 12 tribes of Israel, decided they were gonna back Gibeah and not come and be a part of it. So the Israelites went to war and they killed all the fighting men except for 600 of them, all of them from Benjamin. And so they were wiped out. And so now what's happened is Israel's dealing with the fallout of that victory. So in verse one, it says, the men of Israel had sworn in mitzvah saying, none of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin in marriage. So let's look at this and see what happens next. Just because I want you to remember that there's 600 people alive, 600 men are alive. They're sitting in a place called the Rock of Rimon, and they've been hiding there for four months. The Israelites know they're there, but they haven't went in and destroyed them. Verse two says, so the people came to Bethel and sat down there before God until evening, and they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. This is the third time we've seen Israel weeping. Um, they do not want to be going to war against their brothers. They do not hate them with a visceral hatred. This is their family. This is a part of their identity. Their whole identity is wrapped up that they are the sons of Abraham. They are the 12 tribes. They are entered into the promised land. They are the receivers of God's blessing, his covenant and his inheritance. And if one of them is gone, then part of the foundation upon who they find their identity in is gone. And so they're weeping. They don't know what to do. Verse three says, they said, why, O Lord God of Israel, has this come about in Israel so that one tribe should be missing today in Israel? The author uses the word Israel three times to let us know that this story, this passage is about a nation and how a nation is falling apart. And I want you to understand this, that God's promise was made to Abraham and his descendants. So that includes the entire nation. Israel still has an identity as a nation today. They were struggling with their identity even way back now, way back here, because they had infighting and a civil war. One would say that asking this question, why, O God of Israel, has this come about, is actually a progress for Israel. Because up to this point, everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Everyone does whatever seems best. They integrate other religions, they make decisions daily about how they're gonna worship. They do everything on their own. And so now that they're returning to the Lord in the previous chapters, they asked him, should we go to war? And now that they're asking God, why has this happened? We think that this might actually be a good thing. And so brothers and sisters, if you're in your life and you're starting to ask, why has this happened? How did we get here? You're in a good place, especially if you're going to the Lord God who created you and asking these questions. However, on the outside looking in, we think, what do you mean, how did you get here? It's obvious to us, you rebelled against God, you ignored him, you did whatever you wanted, and you did it not just once, but you did it for a 100 years. You did it for a long time, your daddies did it, your grandparents did it, you live just like you were taught to live, and you have not returned to God until now. That is why this has happened. And the truth is to us, it's obvious because we have to read the story looking back with 2020 vision, they were living the story and they were confused because in all honesty, they didn't set out each day thinking, how can we take God off today? But this is nevertheless where they ended up. And asking the question of God, how did I get here? Is a great place to start in your repentance. And so I don't know if you, you may not feel especially guilty or especially evil, but if you get to a place where you start asking, why did this happen? How did, why me? How did this get here? Then you're in a good place. You can see yourself in Israel today because Israel is going to try to make amends. They're going to try to fix this situation um, with their own wisdom and their own cleverness. And we're going to see that it actually, instead of fixing things, perpetuates um, some difficulties for them. 
Let's look at it together. In verse 4, it says, It came about the next day that the people arose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. They were doing mosaic worship. They weren't doing worship of the pagan gods. This is another step in the right direction. They started offering sacrifices to God. In modern day lingo, this would be that they returned to a Bible teaching church and gathered together to give God the praise he's due and to ask him to intercede on their behalf. In verse five, it says, then the sons of Israel said, who is there among the tribes of Israel who did not come up from the assembly of the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord at Mitzvah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the sons of Israel were sorry for the brother Benjamin and said, One tribe is cut off from us today. What shall we do for wives for those who are left, since we have sworn by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? Verses 5 through 7 um, give us an introduction to the last two parts of the book of Judges. The first part is in verse 5, and it basically asks the questions, who did not come up to fight with us against Benjamin? And there's only one per place, one city, and it's Jabesh Gilead. It's from the land of Gilead, right? It's a city within Gilead, and these people didn't come up to fight against Benjamin. And they had sworn an oath to kill those people, who didn't come up and fight as a congregation before they went to war to Benjamin. So they're finishing up what they had sworn to do. And uh, the second issue occurs in verses six through uh, six through seven, where he says, what, what are we going to do? What, how are we going to handle the fact that there are 600 men from Benjamin? How are we going to handle that and help them repopulate so that we don't totally lose this tribe? You see, Israel was sorry that their brother Benjamin was wiped out. They weren't happy that their enemy was dead. Um, and so they wanted to restore him, but they had taken an oath. Just like they took an oath to kill the people who didn't come to battle, they took an oath for that nobody could give their daughters in marriage to Jabesh Gilead. And so they're in, a prop, they're in a pickle. They have to solve the problem of how can we help our brother become a nation again without giving him our daughters in marriage. And so what we're going to see in this next chapter, the end of the chapter, is how they solve that problem. It's not pretty. Let's look at it. It says, verse 8, we begin to answer the first question about what do we do with the people who didn't show up for battle? All right. Um, verse 8 says, and they said, what one is there of the tribe of Israel who did not come up to the Lord at Mitzvah? And behold, no one had come up from the camp of Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were numbered, Behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. And the congregation sent 12,000 of the valiant warriors there and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the little ones. This is the thing that you should do. You should utterly destroy every man and every woman who is lain with a man. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man by lying with them. And they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. The whole congregation sent word and spoke to the sons of Benjamin, who were at the rock of Ramon, and proclaimed to them peace. Benjamin returned at that time, and they gave the women whom they had taken alive from Jabesh Gilead, yet they were not enough for them. So what they try to do here is solve two problems in one instance. They find out that the people of Jabesh Gilead didn't come to war against Benjamin. And since they had taken an oath before God, and they're in the God-worshipping mood at this time, they fulfill their oath. They say, whoever didn't come up to war, we're going to kill them. And so they found out that Jabesh Gilead didn't send anybody. So what they do, they took 12,000 foot soldiers um, armed and ready for battle, sent them to Jabesh Gilead and sent them there with a purpose. You kill everything that moves except for women who have not had sex with a man, the virgins. And so that's what they did. They killed man, woman, and child, elderly, the animals, and they destroyed the city. And they left only out of that city 400 people alive. And those were virgin women that they brought back to the nation of Israel. 
Now, what they had decided to, to do is take those 400 women and give them to the, the 600 men who were in the rock at Ramon, the descendants of Benjamin, who had not been killed in the battle. But that's not enough. It's only 400 to 600. There's still 200 men without a wife. And so they have another problem to solve, and that's what the second half of the chapter solves. But what I want you to notice first is that the thing that started this whole process was a bunch of men from the uh, uh, surrounding the Levite and his concubine in this little town. And they went in and they killed and raped this woman who didn't deserve it. And this Levite dismembered her body and sent it out. If you guys remember the story, you can go back and read it just two chapters earlier. And so what happens is, now, as a response, one of the things that they do is they send 12,000 men to surround a city full of people who actually haven't killed anybody, right? They didn't go to war. They didn't slaughter anybody. And they're putting them to death, everyone. And the only people that they protect and keep are actually virgins, which is kind of the, actually the opposite of the concubine earlier who had actually committed adultery on his, on her husband. And that's why he had went to go get her in the first place and bring her home. That's why he had to stop in Gibeah in the first place. So this 400 virgins, I want to ask you a question and I don't want to be un, uncouth, but how did they know that they were virgins? Well, it's not like they asked their moms and their dads. It's not like the women who just watched their brothers get murdered before their eyes were quick to confess, oh, this is my status sexually. The truth is, brothers and sisters, 12,000 men went and brutally murdered an entire city because they made an oath before God. We've seen similar stupid um, oaths in the Old Testament. Um, there's one guy who... Uh, Gave, made an oath that if God gave him the battle, whatever came through the doors of the city when he returned, he would sacrifice to God. And it happened to be his only daughter. And so, brothers and sisters, making oaths about sacrifice and giving things to God, God takes those seriously. He wants us to fulfill those. But I just want you to notice that from our perspective, this is not something that God asked for. God didn't ask that king to make that oath, and he didn't ask Israel to make that oath about the people who didn't come up to war. This is something that the people did, and this is something the people messed up. This is the people trying to ask God to drive the car and also keeping one hand on the wheel at the same time, and they make things worse. And so I want you to understand here that this is not something that God delights in, but in order for these people to understand where these women were in their development physiologically, they had to probably check. And that's not something that's uncommon even in the Middle East today. People valued virginity very highly then and they do now. And what they did is they probably had to force these women to reveal their status. And so they murdered their families, they murdered everybody, they did everything to this city, this village, they did it passionately that they should have done to the nations around it, the pagan nations, but they didn't do that. And we see again that Israel's willing and ready to attack themselves, but not the people who are the true enemies of God. So they violate these women and they come back, they take them back as slaves, right? Their own people, they take their own people back as slaves, 400 women, and then they give them in marriage, an arranged marriage, a forced marriage to another tribe that's in bad standing, who's hiding in a rock and whose entire nation had been destroyed. So they take these 400 women and they tell the boys, come back down from the rock of Ramon. The tribe of Benjamin has hope for the future now because we took an oath not to give any of our daughters to them. And so these 400 women are not our daughters. They're somebody else's daughters. So what they're trying to do is fulfill their oath. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're trying to solve the problem of Benjamin while not violating an oath on their own. Do you see how hard they try to keep their own oaths, their own vows, when they were not willing to keep the vows that God had made for them? The vows that God made for them are much easier. It's like 
kill a cow, smoke offering it to me, and then eat the steak that's left over. Enjoy the fat of the land. Let me walk with you as you were created to be. Instead, they're wheeling and dealing with killing one another, civil war, and destroying the lives of innocent girls just so that they can keep their selves mentally unstained because they took an oath that we didn't have to take in the first place. Do you see how much effort we use when we try to sanctify ourselves, when we try to make ourselves whole and pure? Do you see what we have to do when we let sin come into our lives and pervert everything around us? It's horrible. So these women were given to these men, but there were 200 short. And so the last half of this chapter focuses on how to fill that 200 person gap. And it gets worse. In verse 15, it says, And the people were sorry for Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. The elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for our wives and for those who are left since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? We still have this problem. They said, There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, so that tribe will not be blotted out from Israel. But we cannot give them wives of our daughters, for the sons of Israel had sworn, saying, Cursed is he who gives his wife or wife to Benjamin. So they said, Behold, there's a feast of the Lord from year to year in Shiloh, which is um, on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south side of Labona. And they commanded the sons of Benjamin, these are the bad guys, right? Saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards. It should be about 200 of them because they're the only ones that don't have wives left. And watch, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to take part in the dances, then you shall come out of the vineyards, each of you, and you shall catch his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. And so what's happened is they have a religious festival in this place called Shiloh. Um, it's the place the Ark of the Covenant was at this time. And so the women would migrate there and they would have a feast uh, uh, once a year. And a part of this feast was dancing and celebration, and celebration at any, as it is at any feast. And they said, basically, you guys go out and lie and wait in the field. You stalk, you be perverts, you, you lurk out in the field. And when these women, these virgins come out there to dance, what you're going to do is you're going to snatch them up. You're going to kidnap them and you're going to take them back to Benjamin. That way we can say, we didn't give them to you. You stole them. But it says, it shall come about, verse 22, when their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, that we shall say to them, give them to us voluntarily, because we did not take each man from Benjamin a wife in battle, nor did you give them to, to them, else you would now be guilty. The sons of Benjamin did so and took wives according to the number from those who danced, whom they carried away and went and returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the cities and lived in them. The sons of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and his family and each one of them went out from there to his inheritance. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so they solved the problem. They found wives for the tribe of Benjamin. The 600 men got 600 wives, and they went back and rebuilt their city, and the tribe of Benjamin persisted. Um, in a lot of ways, historically, this is good. Um, but... It's good for those people who came as a result of those unions. Uh, we're going to find that even King Saul is rescued after his death from a group of men from Jabesh Gilead, this very city that they just burnt to the ground um, and whose daughters they stole and gave to Benjamin. And so what we have to ask here is what happened in this last section? Well, we have the Israelite leaders, religious leaders, setting up people who are coming to worship, innocent women, to be kidnapped, forced into marriage, and taken from their families and their homes. We have a very mob-like um, response from the leaders who promise the people of Benjamin, we will not come to you and fight you about this. If you do this, we'll solve the problem, our bigger problem, and the littler problem of a ticked-off father or son whose sister or daughter has literally been kidnapped We'll ignore. We'll tell them when they come in, go back to your house. Don't cause a fuss. Do this because you're helping the nation of Israel. You're helping them by keep helping us keep an oath. And 
brothers and sisters, this is just the most backwards, not God honoring way of solving your problems that I can imagine. These poor women were kidnapped, just like the women from um, Jabesh Gilead were kidnapped. They were forced into marriage, taken from their families and forced into places that they weren't supposed to be or they weren't intended to be. And the reason behind all of this is supposedly worship. All of a sudden now we want to be covenant keeping people. And I want you to notice something. When you have to repent and you come out of sin and you start honoring your word and you start getting right before God, there is going to be some collateral damage. There is no way that you can surround yourself and put roots down in the darkness of this world. And then when God pulls you up and pulls you out, there is no way it doesn't mess up some of the things around you. That's just a warning to you. What you can get by the author's description of what happened is that there's no easy way to fix the results of sin when you live in it and when you pursue it. The longer you pursue it, the harder it is. So I want to encourage you today. Don't be like Israel. Don't continue in sin until God has to punish you. Don't continue in sin unabated. At the end of this book and at the end of the chapter, it tells us that everyone did what was right in their own eyes and there was no king in Israel, which means there was no justice system and they didn't follow any particular authority. They did what was right in their own eyes. And this is the consequence of everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. The sad truth is they had a king. His name is the Lord God. He became Jesus Christ as a man and walked on this earth, but he ruled and reigned even then. And he gave them the authority to work in his, in his stead. They were his people but they ignored him. They turned away from him. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, not in the eyes of God. They didn't keep his law. They didn't obey his law. And so brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today. Look at what the result is when we sin against God. We can return to him. There's hope. But even when we return to him, there is a great amount of collateral damage as we try in our weakness to make things right before God. Hopefully you understand if you're a Christian today that all that work, all that struggle to make things right with God, all that collateral damage, it can be avoided today. You say, how? Well, that is what Jesus came to do. He came to pay the price of our sins and our rebellion. He died for every evil deed we have done so that we don't have to project that violence onto anyone else as we leave our situations. We don't have to make anything else right because Jesus paid it all. He made it all right. If you're out there today and you haven't accepted Jesus as your savior today, return to him today. This is what he came to fix. He came to fix the fact that we are broken beyond remedy. And when we even try to return to God, we destroy everything around us. And so, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, in Jesus, we have forgiveness of sins. In Jesus, we can be made whole. In Jesus is where we will find hope for the future. We have a king. We don't get to do what's right in our own eyes. We have a king, and we should follow him every single day. May God help you to avoid the mistakes that Israel made in the days to come. If you have any questions, reach out to us at Contact Pioneer Baptist Church. I'm sorry, at Contact Pioneer Baptist at gmail.com or come see us in person at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays and 10:30 a.m. on Sundays. May God bless you and your families.